Hi everyone and welcome to Priority Holder, and today we'll be playing Shadowfax Lord of Horses in Historic Brawl. Now Shadowfax is a 5 mana 4-4 four four that gives horses haste. Also, whenever it attacks, we can put a creature card from our hand onto the battlefield with lesser power, tapped and attacking. So this whole deck is built around that second ability, full of creatures with less than 4 power that make an impact when they hit the battlefield. Now it is possible to try and augment Shadowfax's power and cheat bigger things into play, but we decide not to horse around and stick with 3 power or less. So that means things like Brutal Cathar, which can exile something, Elite Spellbinder, which can attack their hand a little bit, Loran, which can blow up artifacts and enchantments, and Skyca Skyclave Apparition is like general removal. And so that's the idea. The one exception to the, to the 3 power constraint is Elish Norn, Mother of Machines, since we have so many end of the battlefield abilities. But other than that, we're trying to cheat things in and snowball our way to a victory. Anyway, let's jump into some games. All right, first opponent is original Alila in Esper colors. And this looks like a fine hand to keep. So the way original Alila works is whenever they play an artifact or enchantment, they get to create a fairy token. She also boosts fairy to fairies by one power and has a handful of other abilities. But Authority of the Consul's turn one from the opponent is pretty devastating considering our commander's haste. So, so this is actually already a decision point on our side, whether you start with Ornithopter or Mindstone. Mindstone's a little safer, but it doesn't allow us to double spell right here. So there is that trade-off. All right, and we get our lore and memory lapse. So you can see we're hunting down the authority of the consoles right away because that's gonna really hamper our shadow facts plan. Esper Sentinel from the opponent. Fortunately for us, we have like a very creature heavy hand. We don't have to worry about the tax so much. So Lauren comes in. Yeah, we're gonna take down authority. And then second piece of ramps a creature also, so we don't have to worry about the Esper Sentinel tax at all that turn. All right, so they bolt their land in. Here's Alila. Is it Alayla, Alila? I don't know. No one knows. Priest of Ancient Lore. Now I play this to get a third creature in play. That way our Kabir takedown can get rid of Alila. And we even have enough for the tax. Now we're gonna go ahead and send him with Laura in here. Esper Sentinel is sort of annoying, so we wouldn't mind the trade, but if opponent decides to take it, they realize there's probably some value to be had with Esper Sentinel. Black Market Connections. Very strong follow-up from them. All right, and they still have the land drop. So that allows them to pay life each turn to get either a card, a treasure, or a 3-2 changeling, which would benefit off Alila's fairy boosting. So it seems like a good time for evasion of Gobakan. Like we can cast Shadow Facts, but there's like no value. We don't have any creatures in hand. So let's see what invasion hits. And boy, we're we glad we did. Seagate Restoration, sure, but Cyclonic Rift, is pretty nasty and we're happily taxing that by two. Not only that, but we're able to send four total power at invasion to attempt to flip it right here. So opponent can stop us by just blocking. Also note the opponent could have rifted without overload in response, but chose not to. So so now, th now they have a nine mana cyclonic rift if they want to overload it. Right, opponent pays the full six. I love the boldness. Here comes Alila for round two. Problem is, the opponent's already sitting at seven mana, and Cyclonic Rift would be pretty devastating. So I decide here, like, it seems like a good time to try and draw some action with Loran. Um, because opponent can just opt to make a treasure next turn with Black Market, and then bolt in you know, the Seagate, which we know they have, to hit us with the Cyclonic Rift, which would be just devastating. So. Drawing as many cards as we can, including Cracking the Mind Stone. We did get some nice stuff. Season Pyromancer is amazing, but Charming Prince is gonna allow us to do some tricks here. So here comes Shadow Facts. Let's see what we can do. So I'm gonna send it with all of them. And Shadow Facts, you can see I almost went with Season Pyromancer for the value, but honestly, Charming Prince is the play here. Because Charming Prince, among its modes, it can flicker a creature, and so we can flicker Loren, 
to ensure that they can't hit Cyclonic Rift mana next turn. Outside of like a Dark Ritual, you know, so. So it does unfortunately remove an attacker, but I think it's worth it to shut down Rift for another turn. Okay, so opponent's gonna two um, block. Unfortunately, Charm Prince just gets eaten and they gain some life off of Leela. Um, we could have sacked Invasion of Govicon to keep it around. It didn't seem like that important. So we're going to cut down Black Market Connections. That buys us at least one more turn, you know, barring Dark Ritual. All right, so they do have... So they have eight mana sources now, so it's getting a little dicey for us. And yeah, they get the Alila attack, lock in some life gain. And they're passing. So who knows what kind of nasty stuff they have. Minas Tirith is good. Um, might be useful some, for some card draw. Optifire up Den of the Bugbear here. Seems really safe. Get some extra damage in. We know we can put Season Pyro in for free off of Shadowfax, so might as well get the extra attacker in there. All right, let's see what happens. Now, I am really not happy to get rid of God's Willing. Like, that seems like a good closer. But Season Pyromancer forces the double discard, and honestly, like, getting Pyro in play, getting all that power in play seems very worth it here. All right, so opponent just takes the damage here. Falling to just two life. Vision of Gobacon's going off a bit. So now, all right, so they do have mana source number nine. And Alila is just once again coming in to lock in the life gain. So, so opponent has Cyclonic Rift at the ready and they don't fire it off and they still haven't fired it off. And so I think they make a tactical error. So we're definitely gonna fire up them the bugbear because Cyclonic Rift bounces non-land permanents. So bugbear is gonna be immune to that. So. Opponent has the opportunity to rift here before combat. They don't. They let us attack, which I think is a pretty critical mistake for them because Shadowfax is going to get to put something into play. And they, there's all sorts of nasty stuff we could put into play. So I think from their perspective, doing it pre-combat would have been much better because we actually have the perfect card to seal the win right here. Plundering Barbarian with the artifact destruction mode because we're going to be able to destroy Esper Sentinel and not even allow the chump block on the Den of the Bugbear. So here comes Rift, which we knew was coming and we prepared for. And opponent sees the writing on the wall because their thing's dead and Bugbear is coming in for the win. Excellent game. I love that that creature land. Now as we move to the next game, please remember to broken dam the like button, comment, and subscribe. It supports the channel and helps you know what the people want. Thank you. Okay, so we're playing against new Narset right here. And I'm not familiar with it. Our hand looks great, but I'm looking at it here. So it gives their creatures prowess, and whenever she attacks, they get like a free uh, flashback from the graveyard. So could be pretty nasty. Seems like a pr particularly strong commander. Turn one brainstorm from the opponent. It has the potential of brainstorm locking them, so we'll have to see where it goes. Definitely get the tap land out of the way. We don't. It doesn't seem like we'll need to cycle it anytime soon. Search for us, Conte. So here's the question. Do we just run out Spirited Companion, you know, get the card draw? Or possibly blow up Search for us, Conte, which can basically set up their draws and charge up their graveyard for the remainder of the game. So decide it actually is worth it to, to cut it down and just deny them that selection. The opponent has another powerful play with Expressive Iteration. They hit their land drop. Okay, so we have plenty of mana. It seems like an excellent turn to hit them with the Elite Spellbinder to see what's going on there. And we're checking it out. Probably gonna grab Deafening Clarion, but opponent just packs it in all of a sudden. So I'm still not used to the unranked queue. So that seemed very premature to me, but maybe they just, yeah, had enough with our disruption. So we take those and we're on to the next one against Hajar Loyal Bodyguard. Now, Hajar cares about legendary creatures. He could sacrifice himself to give them plus one, plus zero, and indestructible until end of turn. So, expecting to see a lot of legends from the opponent. 
So you can play all the nasty ones in red, green, and use your use your commander to protect them when the removal comes down. So Spirit of Companion, let's see what else happens. And they have Rahilda. This is an alchemy card. I'm not too familiar. It does a whole lot of stuff, but basically when it hits players, they get stuff. So I'll have to pay attention to that. Now, Guardian of Gearpur is actually like a pretty nice draw. Um, we could flicker Spirit of Companion and get an extra card draw. Have sort of like an enter the battlefield sub theme in Shadowfax. You know, just a lot of little value creatures that Shadowfax can cheat in. So we have some extra flickering things and sort of like Panharmonicon esque stuff because we got that going on. You know, like Ephemerate. Now, their creature is a first striker, so it seems like a very sketchy block here. It is unfortunate they get to, like, sort of use the Ragavan effect and, like, steal stuff off the top of our library, but just seemed like a risky block there, even though we had a 3 3. The one ring, hello, yes, definitely keep that on top. And Skyclave is incredible here because you can just get their commander right off the battlefield. Considered getting Rahilda. But considering, yeah, it just seemed like their commander is a little more valuable. So we're just trying to tax their commander out of relevance. None of that, but they don't even get like the consolation prize if they don't keep it under Skyclave. So they play another alchemy legend. I can't keep up all the alchemy stuff. So I just learn it as I go, as I encounter them here. The one ring. If we had an untapped land, might have gone for zealous con conscripts, but uh, one ring seems pretty good here. Ephemerate is going to be really nice with Skyclave. Just going to let us rebuy Skyclave at some point, and their deck seems rife with targets for it. So potential Shadow Facts coming down next turn. All right, fight rigging from them. They get to hide away something and place a counter. And once they have something that's seven power, they can free cast the thing underneath the the fight rigging. Yeah, so the opponent's force just passed because the one ring is giving us protection. All right, so we have our land, and yeah, time to start one ringing. This card is super strong, super fun. Ragavan and a Shatter Skull. Seems pretty great. So this is a pretty nice turn here because we have Shadowfax and we have Ephemerate up in case things get nasty. The question is how to navigate this turn. Um, it seems best to just send in Shadowfax and the Flyer and see how it, what, what happens from there. Decide to, to throw Lauren on the battlefield, just not even mess around fight rigging, like there could be something really nasty under there and it's gonna buff their creatures, so. Get rid of fight rigging. All right, Atarka's Command. So that's a pretty sweet play from the opponent because it buffs their creatures and gives them reach. And so now it's looking pretty grim. And so I think I make a, a gameplay error here. I could have targeted Guardian, which would have came back and then exiled Skyclave. Though I guess that would have meant Shadowfax would have died. So doing it directly on the Skyclave preserves Shadowfax, but kills the Guardian. So I, th I think this actually was the right play. So Shadow Spear from the opponent. And honestly, we're super happy to see the equip here because that's just not doing enough compared to what we're doing at the moment. Like. They needed to get some more creatures on the battlefield, so they do lock in some life gain. Fortunately for us, they're just nabbing all of our expensive things, so they can't actually cast them with their only two mana open. So here, here's an interesting gameplay decision here. Do you ephemerate something? Like I was, yeah, about to just ephemerate Skyclave, but as I started mathing it out, or sorry, ephemerate, yeah, Skyclave or Spirit of Companion, realized that they're at 19, we can maybe kill them this turn. So end up declining the ephemerate. You're not going to see me do that that often, but like I said, started mathing it out and realizing we might be able to kill them. So run one ring draws a bunch of cards. We definitely get a land. Lightning bolt is really sweet, but the main ingredient is zealous conscripts stealing their creature. So zealous conscripts alone represents adding six power to the board, and then shadow facts can add at least two more. Like, if we put Warhound in, that's three power. Decide to put Ragavan in for the upside, like, get a treasure and steal something from them. And just bracing ourselves to see if the opponent has anything. Steal their Great Henge for 
good measure. But we beat them all the way down to two. And then have the lightning bolt for the finish. Do they have anything? That is it. Clean win. On to the next one. And we're playing Venser Corpse Puppet. So Venser's a two mana one three lifelink toxic one. And whenever they proliferate, they get to choose one of two uh, bonuses, one of which is to make a 3-3. Now this is a rough hand. This is a mulligan here. We don't have any early plays. This hand is is better, but the mana is awkward, and we don't have any like super early plays. Like you could see, we're sort of stuck at uh, three mana. So this might be a misplay off the bat right here. I was trying to just get the red source online, but looking at you know the fact that their commander's two mana, the fact that we have swords, and we have all three mana plays, honestly, probably should have went turn one secluded step, because now. I want to swords their commander and have to sort of force myself to play off curve next turn potentially. And I make a pretty critical mistake, sort of like next leveling myself. I knew I was probably going to swords their commander, should have just done it on my turn, or at least before they attack, and don't do it. Because honestly, what are they going to play that's worse than their commander, realistically? And the mistake against Venser is you don't want the first poison counter because their whole deck is loaded with proliferate effects. Like that's that's the whole name of the game with them. And so you could see sort of the nightmare scenario unfolding here. I, I made the mistake of just not swordsing right away when they are shields down, because it would have bought us a lot of time. And we you know, we see a brutal Cathar sky clip, like we could have taxed their commander out into oblivion. But here it comes again, and you know, we can sky clave it, but we've already picked up that one poison counter. Which is pretty rough, and not only not only that, but we're missing land drops, which which is not great. Skyclave has been really good in all these matchups. All right, so this card they played would have given us a poison counter anyway, but you could see here comes the sort of wave of proliferate cards, and we're just sort of falling behind. The thing about poison, like you can die so quickly, like you just need ten. So handful of proliferates, handful of poisons, and. You're done though, so tacking in, but it's not looking great because when their creature hits us, their 2 1, they get a free proliferate. So we play a, a flyer to, to attempt to threaten the block, but they have an excellent player right here with Jace from uh, Shadows of Innerstrad block because there's a very cheap ability to just keep bouncing things. Now it's not great to bounce sky clay, but stuff like welcoming vampire, like sure they could bounce it all day. So honestly, maybe should have slammed one ring here, but it just doesn't doesn't do as much work when you're behind and you don't have a lot of mana sources yet. It's much better slamming at turn seven, but here comes the proliferate train. And we're already up to four poison counters, and Jace, of course, yeah, it's just going to bounce the uh, Mothra once again. And proliferate plays extremely well with planeswalkers because you can just passively give them more loyalty. So Jace can sort of just keep minusing over and over again. So you could see things just sort of falling apart right here. Now, they did have a different way to give us a poison counter with that, that black card they played, so but you could see like the turn one swords decision could have we could have been playing more on curve. And been more in this game. Now, granted, we did miss some land drops, so it, it's hard to say. But opponent is pressing their advantage really well here. And these servitors are just giving them so many proliferate triggers that, like, we're already at eight. I could see the writings on the wall and, and pack it in. So, unfortunate, but it's part of the game. It's okay. On to the next one against Lanus Cryptozoologist. Now, Lanus is not putting, like, Ethereum and Bitcoin in, like, a zoo. She's about cryptids, you know, like Bigfoot and stuff like that. So, another mulligan, just not really much to do in that hand. And yeah, keep this hand right here. Not the biggest fan of the snarls, but they do, you know, early game, they, they sort of do what they're supposed to if you have enough basics. 
And the eerie silence starts here because you could sort of hear the audio degrading. I don't know why it does that at the end of recording sometimes, but to spare you to sort of like jittering, just end up muting the, the, the gameplay noise. So it'll just be me, me from here on out. But yeah, turn one bolt there. Commander feels great. Just tax it right up to two mana. Or sorry, up to four mana and move on with our lives. So buy ourselves some time. Now their commander wants them to get a lot of clue tokens out. And they can sacrifice a bunch of clues to get some value. Now, card from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. That lets them draw cards when they hit players. So it seems like a pretty good candidate for Justice Strike. So we're going to go ahead and fire that off. We don't want them getting any card advantage and can just attack him with our Selfless Spirit. All right, Cultivate from the opponent. Doing what green decks do and... And starting to ramp. All right, and they're already up to five mana, and we don't even have another land in sight. We do, however, have Alabaster Host Intercessor, and we're definitely going to plane cycle that right here. That one's doing nice double duty. It can act as like sort of like a Skyclave that Shadowfax can cheat in, but also a plane cycler. So definitely needed it right there, and decide just, you know. It's un with with how little mana we have, it just seems fine to just play out Dire Fleet Daredevil. It would have been nice to actually play the cultivate from their graveyard, but decide to just run it out and not get the flashback value. So opponent has an Elvish Rejuvenator, so they have really getting going on their mana. Attack with everyone. And we're at least able to pressure them a bit right here. So the question is, do we play Arcane Signet or do we hold up Restoration Angel? It seems like prudent to get Shadow Facts online. My opponent has the Metallic rebu for, Rebuke for our, our for our Mana Rock. So not at five mana yet. An opponent has like a huge mana advantage on us. So here they cast Croaking Counterpart on our Selfless Spirit. And you can see I think about it for quite a while. Decide it's better for us to lose it and to deny them. This is the classic, you know, game's not going well, take your basketball and go home situation. I don't want you to have the selfless spirit, so I'll get rid of it. <laughs> um, it but yeah, it just seemed like that 1-1 one, one flyer and the on-demand indestructible would be really annoying, so decide just to fizzle the spell. Now, it's really tempting here to play Shadow Effects, except that they clearly have mana to play their commander and they did not. So it seems like they're just holding up a counter spell and that would be devastating getting taxed all up to seven mana. So especially since we have a good instant speed play with Restoration Angel, just pass the turn here. Now it could be that they're just worried about getting whammied by removal again. They're like waiting to like play their commander, but like here they pass with eight mana up and they still don't cast their commander, which they need in play in order to generate the clues. So there is a big priority pass here, and we get like a tiny bit of value here by flickering the Dire Fleet Daredevil because we can eat the, the croaking counterpart from the graveyard and exile it. So we won't get to cast it, but we can deny them from flashing it back. And of course, we get a 3 4 flyer for our troubles. Extra mana source is nice. But at this point, we can just sort of wait for them to do something. It's like the classic make control make the first move, you know, like we're on board already. We're threatening to kill them in two turns. So we're not going to just run our commander out and do like what seems like an obvious counter spell. So opponent passes again and they're thinking about it, thinking about it and they pack it in. So the reason I think shadow facts is so fun is that it gives you an interesting deck building condition. By choosing impactful creatures with three power or less, you end up with stuff like Angel of Sanctions and Alabaster Host Intercessor and Meteor Golem and Siege Gang Commander. So a collection of cards you might not normally see together otherwise forms the core of your Shadow Facts deck. And what I really like about it is how you can just start snowballing if you start cheating things in, especially if you have ways to keep protecting Shadow Facts. And it's just sort of a fun, explosive play style. Now, if I were to change this build a little bit, I would probably shave some of the higher mana value stuff and lower the curve a little bit. It is tempting because Shadow Facts can cheat things in for zero mana to keep loading up on like big juicy things. But as you saw in some of those games, it gets a little clunky sometimes if you can't deploy your hand. So I would try and maybe lower the curve a little bit. 
But anyway, let me know what you think about Shadow Facts in the comments and tell me what your favorite horse card in Magic is. Anyways, thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day.